Have we finally found a room temperature superconductor? Or are we looking at scientific malpractice? Again, the scientific community isn't sure. So let's discuss it. Superconductors have zero resistance. So finding a room temperature ambient pressure superconductor would completely revolutionize the world. There are not many potential technologies that we can say that about, but having current flow without any resistance and as such, no loss or heat would completely change how we interface with electricity. Computers would run faster and require less cooling. We could make magnetic levitation commonplace, resulting in trains becoming more efficient and faster. And our energy consumption would go down, something we desperately need to fight climate change. So why don't we have a room temperature superconductor already? Well, as cool as superconductivity is, it is a fickle beast that likes the cold and despises heat. As such, it has been a really tricky task to find a material that will put up with the harsh conditions of room temperature and ambient pressure. So let's take one of the parameters off the table and aim for room temperature, but at higher pressures. This technique has worked wonders and allowed us to produce superconductors that worked well above 200 Kelvin. And the ultimate goal has been to find the right recipe to produce a material that will crack the room temperature threshold. But this has resulted in some dubious scientific behavior. Many of these materials are just not reproducible as they can form during the application of high pressure itself rather than being produced in a controllable fashion. And there have been more than one serious accusation of scientific malpractice. There was a paper published claiming that they had produced a room temperature superconductor back in 2020. But this paper came under a lot of scrutiny and was ultimately retracted. And this is important as some of the same authors are present in this new claim of superconductivity. The retraction was because the authors used a normalization technique that was not common, was not consistent with what they said they did in the paper, and many question if this is indeed a valid method at all. Likewise, another author of this latest claim has been accused of altering data in the past, which also led to a paper retraction. As such, this places a massive cloud of doubt over these latest results. Some experts simply don't believe the results at all considering who's involved, while others believe that the extended review process that this publication underwent given the past retraction has given these results a lot more credence. So what did they actually demonstrate? They used a few different metrics to perform the analysis of the onset of superconductivity. So let's just focus on two. First, they showed that at 10 kilobars of pressure, which is roughly 10,000 times atmospheric pressure, that this material has a sharp drop in resistance at 294 Kelvin, i.e. it became superconducting. But generally speaking, this is not enough to claim superconductivity. The device is in a high pressure diamond anvil cell and other things could go wrong to produce this drop. So it requires additional validation. One additional method is to measure the specific heat of the sample, which is a measure of how much energy is required to heat the sample by one degree. Going through a phase transition requires more energy than just heating the sample. This is the same as melting ice. It requires energy to melt the ice itself, not just to heat the water. The same is true for transitioning from a superconductor back to the normal state of the material. As such, at the same temperature that the resistance drops to zero, there should be a corresponding increase in the specific heat. This is exactly what they observed, which is compelling evidence for superconductivity. But with the questions of past altering of data, this is still questionable and needs to be verified by another research group. Which takes us to our next issue, reproducibility and the role of companies. One important aspect of this latest research to point out is the role that commercializability is playing in this. Science should be free for dissemination, 
but modern research has turned into a game of producing technologies that can be commercialized. This is in part a reaction to government funding, which has shifted more and more to the question of what science is returning in the short term for their investment. And part of this is creating metrics for how many patents you are on and how well these patents have been commercialized. But the problem is that this can lead to a conflict of interests where potential company profits override scientific objectives. In a quote from Quanta magazine, Diaz, the head researcher on this project said this, we are not going to distribute this material considering the proprietary nature of the processes and the intellectual property rights that exist. But the only way to confirm if their result is real is to have another group independently demonstrate this superconductivity. The easiest way would be to share the material with another group for testing. And Diaz said that he's not willing to do this. This would leave other groups to try to replicate the material themselves. And why Diaz says that we have clear and detailed instructions on how to make our samples. There is still a question of if some key details are missing for intellectual property reasons. And of course, if people try and fail, you could always say that it is their fault for not making the material correctly. In the end, we are still not sure if this is truly a room temperature superconductor or not. With more research from independent groups, we will hopefully find an answer soon enough. High temperature superconductors are extremely interesting. Check out this video to find out more about how researchers detected the mechanism behind how this phenomenon works.